Today's discussion will be with Margaret Roller and Paul Lavracas, authors of Applied Qualitative Research Design, a Total Quality Framework Approach, for which they received the 2021 A4 Book Award. Congratulations on that. And thank you, Margaret and Paul, for being here today. I'm your host, Martha Stapleton. The Book Club 2.0 series is brought to you by the DC A4 Program Committee, of which I'm a member, along with Samantha Goldstein, Zoe Paget, Sarah Spell, Amanda Wilmot, and our fearless leader, Committee Chair Martha McRoy. Our goal for Book Club 2.0 is to provide an interesting and fun forum to review and discuss the latest publications in the field of survey methodology and public opinion research, along with the amazing bonus of interacting directly with those who wrote the book. So how this will work is we're gonna start with Margaret and Paul presenting some highlights and key insights from their book. And then during that part, if you all could please mute your microphones, but feel free to post thoughts or questions in the chat box. And I will be monitoring that throughout the session. Then later on in the hour, we'll open up the floor for discussion. And I encourage you to please not only ask questions, but contribute reactions and comments to each other and with Paul and Margaret. If you're comfortable and can do so, please also turn on your camera when you're speaking. So some of the most helpful insights we feel often come from more unstructured conversation. So, so to the extent that we can mimic that on this Zoom virtual uh, platform or environment, let's, let's give it a try, okay? Um, so I will mind the time and wrap us up at the end of the hour, handing it off at that point to Martha McRoy so she can announce the name of the lucky DC APOR member who will win a copy of Margaret and Paul's book. And of course, a big thank you to the DC APOR Executive Council for providing the opportunity to own the book that we feature in these sessions. It is now my great pleasure and honor to introduce our illustrious authors to you. Margaret Roller is an independent consultant who has worked for more than 40 years in both qualitative and quantitative methods with commercial, nonprofit, and governmental organizations. She has designed and implemented hundreds of qualitative studies, conducted numerous qualitative workshops and training, and written and spoken extensively on quality approaches to research design. In addition to her popular blog, Research Design Review, Margaret is an associate editor for survey practice. She's on the editorial board for Public Opinion Quarterly, and she's the co-founder and past chair of QualPOR, the Qualitative Public Opinion Research Affinity Group in APOR. She's also on the Communications Task Force for the Society for Qualitative Inquiry and Psychology within the American Psychological Association. Dr. Paul Lavrakas is a research psychologist by training who works as a research methodologist. He was the founding faculty director of the Northwestern University Survey Laboratory and the Ohio State University Center for Survey Research and served as vice president and chief methodologist for Nielsen Media Research. He has served in numerous roles within APOR, including as president. His honors include the APOR's Innovators Award for his work on the standard definitions guidelines for response deposition, dispositions and rates and APOR's exceptionally distinguished Achievement Lifetime Award in 2019. Among his publications, he is the editor of the Encyclopedia of Survey Research Methods and lead editor of three books on election polling, the news media, and democracy. Paul currently serves as an adjunct instructor for survey research methods at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and he consults for several government, other public sector, and private sector organizations in the U.S. and internationally. And so with that, Margaret and Paul, over to you. Thank you, Martha. Thank you so much, Martha. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. Let me do that. OK, we should all be good at see, seeing my screen. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Martha and DC APOR and the book club for inviting us to be with you today. We're very excited to be having this discussion and look forward to um, any of your comments and questions as we go along. Um, I, I wanna start by kind of giving you an idea of where the seed of this book came from. Um, and it came from this question you see in front of you, you know, is it good research, which is 
the question that I asked myself, and, and now we're going back decades now, <laughs> we're going back decades to when I left um, graduate school, and my head was full of research best practices as it related to survey and experimental research, but uh, with nothing uh, with respect to qualitative research. So I really left with this, this question in my mind about what is this thing called qualitative research? And, um, and, and, and shouldn't we be asking this question? Is it good research? in qualitative research design, just as we have in survey research design. So I started uh, learning a lot about qualitative research, started thinking a lot about qualitative research and best practices and started reading and uh, writing and talking a lot about it. Um, in about 2008, 2009, I reached out to Paul and um, uh, uh, I shared with him a white paper I had written on best practices. And somewhere along that line, I asked him if he'd be interested in collaborating on a book idea I had. And he said, yes. And so we started working on, um, on uh, something I had started, what became the Total Quality Framework. And the goal with the Total Quality Framework uh, was, is to really fill a, a void, as it says here, where there really was an absence, going back to my question of, is it good research is, you know, in qualitative research design, and I wasn't finding an answer. So the framework was really addressing that void. And it was um, meant to provide a way to think about um, quality and qualitative research and how to integrate, integrate uh, quality uh, design uh, throughout the research process and to provide a framework that you could use in other applications related to qualitative research too. And in that way, by filling this void, elevate qualitative research design to more scrutiny. As we say in the book, you know, the total quality framework brings greater um, rigor um, to qualitative research without stifling all of the great reasons we conduct um, qualitative research and provide a basis by which research can develop critical thinking skills. And I think that is very, very central and important in thinking about the total quality framework, developing critical thinking skills that carry you through the process of conducting qualitative research to reach a higher um, uh, caliber of qualitative research in the end. So what is this, what is the framework? The framework, um, uh, it can, is, there's four components to the, qual the total quality framework. Each component uh, is specific to a different aspect of the research process, as you can see there. Data collection, analysis, reporting, and then ultimately being able to utilize the outcomes. Um, and in that way, the total quality framework um, is meant to guide the researcher um, in the conceptualization, implementation, interpretation, and documentation of their qualitative research to achieve um, outcomes that have value. Um, it looks like this. Um, here are the four components. And today I'm going to um, uh, give you some examples of how you use a total quality, quality um, uh, a framework approach as it relates to each of these components. But before I do, I want to just tell you something uh, about the book itself. The book has eight chapters. It's, it's mostly a methods book. Five of the eight chapters are around methods. We start off, chapters one and two, we start off in the first chapter talking about qualitative research. And we talk about the unique attributes of qualitative research, which is really important to really understanding everything else we talk about in the book and how we approach qualitative research and how we approach um, the implementation of the total quality framework. In chapter two, we talk about the total quality framework, and then we, we, we jump into specific methods. So we have a chapter on in-depth interviews, on focus group discussions, ethnography, uh, content analysis, and multiple methods. Uh, the eighth chapter is on other applications of the total quality framework, and Paul is going to be talking to you folks about that today. And then we end the book with a glossary, a glossary of a lot of the terms that we talk about uh, during the course of the book. Okay, so 
Let's talk about the total quality framework. We're going to start with credibility, which has to do with what? With data collection. And credibility, there are two important aspects uh, with respect to the credibility component. One has to do with scope, what we call scope, um, and one with data gathering. With respect to scope, from um, a total quality framework approach, we're concerned about coverage, such as the representativeness of our participants. In other words, do our participants look like the population segment that we are um, uh, investigating? Um, and to what degree do they not possibly? And that needs to be incorporated in our thinking and analysis as you go forward in your research. Uh, sample design, we talk about precipice sampling instead of convenience or snowball sampling. Now I understand there are times, of course, that you may need to use uh, convenience sampling, but, um, and we talk about this in the book, that even then there are um, considerations that are in play when you go about the sampling process. If you're working with lists, just like in survey research, you would be thinking about how you're gonna stratify that list and selecting across the entire list. We also, from a total quality framework approach, think about non-response. Um, and this is very important. It's a very important in all research, right? And it's just as important in qualitative research because we're concerned that maybe participants or people who agree to participate in our research are maybe um, uh, the same or not compared to those who do not participate in our research. So in the book, we um, offer and we, do, we talk about how to gain access and cooperation with um, with participants. So we offer a, a list of things you should be thinking about when you think about how you're going to gain um, cooperation with your participants. Um, and you can see the list here. Uh, just taking one of them, you know, flexibility of location, I um, hate to uh, tell you how many, how many interview, how many in-depth interviews I have conducted um, in my career. Um, on the back of pickup trucks, let's say, or in um, on construction sites when I have been conducting um, studies with building contractors. And believe me, there's only way, the only way you're going to effectively get them to cooperate for something like that is to be very flexible in where you're gonna actually interview them. Sample size obviously is another consideration within um, within credibility. You know how many events are you going to have? Interviews, groups, observations, whatever. And a total quality framework approach um, asks that you think about that um, in two stage two stages. One is the design stage, of course, where you're going to be thinking about diversity and breadth and depth and the expected variation, and of course, you know, time and money. But we also um, suggest that you, the researcher, should be thinking about it during the field stage. So in the book, we um, provide um, a list of questions that you, the researcher, may be thinking about um, during uh, the field stage to think about whether or not you need to um, conduct more or maybe even less, fewer, um, uh, in this case, interviews. This is this is from chapter three, the interview um, in-depth interview chapter of the kinds of questions that you should be thinking about. I've simply highlighted a few here just to kind of gain your attention, but the um, these are the kinds of things that you might want to think about as you go through the course of, in this case, an interview study. Um, you know, did um, did all the interviewees, did all my participants provide clear answers, or do I need to go back to someone for clarification? Do they tell a story? Um, do I am I gaining new ideas or themes, or am I not? All of these things are are things to consider uh, when you think about your ultimate sample size. In this case, an in, uh, in-depth interview study. So the other aspect of credibility is data gathering. In other words, are your outcomes um, valid? And we have, you know, uh, three ways we kind of consider that question are, you know, are we measuring what we think we are measuring in our qualitative research? Um, one is by the content and by the, uh, the interviewer, moderator, or observer guide. One is researcher effects, one's part participant effects. Um, 
in um, researcher uh, effects, and we'll get to that in a minute, but we we talk about in the book about um, the, um, the importance about thinking about potential bias and inconsistency. So for instance, if you are conducting um, a qualitative research to explore a new concept, a new idea, um, are the researchers or is the researcher um, conveying that concept in the in a in a consistent way from interview to interview and group to group and things of that necessary? Have you developed the kind of rapport that you need to mitigate um, participant effects? Um, to uh, and to increase their willingness and ability to provide you with inf their information and even to increase their willingness and ability to say, I don't know. And we talk about that in the book. Okay, so guide development is um, one of the things that is very, very important to this whole validity issue and uh, gaining valid uh, data back from your um, from your qualitative research. This uh, visualization schematic you see in front of you right now is not in the book. Um, everything I'm going to talk about and everything it conveys is in the book. But soon after the book was published, I realized, you know, I need a, an easier way to, to have a discussion about the funnel approach. So this is what I came up with. And I've given you a citation to you can actually see a, a discussion about this in, the, in my blog. But in any case, the whole idea of the funnel approach, you should go from broad to narrow. And what does that do? The broad gives you the context that you need as the researcher to really fully explore and understand um, uh, uh, what I'm calling stage four here in terms of where you're going with the research and what you're really there to explore and what your key research objective is. And I'm going to give you a little example of that. This is actually taken from the literature. And here is a study that was uh, a, a study to understand the dietary behaviors among low-income people and specifically to, to look at the barriers to the purchase um, and consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. They conducted eight focus group discussions conducted at community facilities. Now, what's great about this particular example and why I took it from the literature is unlike some articles in the literature, they actually provided their guide. They actually provided um, what their guide questions were um, for these focus group discussions which was great, so I could look at that. So, so you can see what they are here. They started off by asking, why do you eat fruits and vegetables? And are you able to buy and prepare as many as you would like? And what makes it harder? Or what would make it easier? Where do you buy your fresh, uh, fresh fruits, uh, fruits and vegetables? You know, what's the most important to you in choosing? What about the produce being organic? Is that important? Um, what um, would you like to see more options and what are types of programs that have, would help you eat more fruits and vegetables. Now, from a total quality framework approach using the funnel model, what is my problem with that? My problem with that is there's no context. If I put this into the funnel model, this is where I come out. I start with that stage two, which is about exploring their current dietary preferences, purchase and consumption. So I'm learning about them and I'm learning about how their lifestyle and other factors influence their, their behavior, their purchase and consumption behavior. And now I can start exploring fruits and vegetables. And now on stage four, I can really get to what I really wanna know and why I'm there, which is to understand and explore how I can increase their purchase and consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. In the book, we also, when it comes to observational research, we, um, uh, in addition to the observation guide, we also offer the reader the observation grid. And we offer this example that you're seeing on the slide here. And the purpose of the grid is just simply to remind the observer of the key points of, um, of the observation and the topic of interest. 
Also important to data gathering, as I mentioned earlier, is what? Is researcher effects. And one of the important areas to, to, to take into consideration is, is the potential for bias, researcher bias. In the book, we include a discussion as, as well as an example of ref, uh, a reflexive journal. Reflexive journal is basically a researcher diary. And it just facilitates the researcher to, or facilitates the researcher's ability to explore um, how they um, uh, re reacted and maybe conducted themselves in the maybe the interview they just conducted or the focus group discussion they just conducted or even in the observational event they just had. Um, it allows, and so what we've done with in the book, and, and I've highlighted a few of these questions just to, to help, help you see what we're um, asking in, in, um, in this image. Uh, what we offer in the book are some examples of the kinds of questions researchers might ask in the reflexive journal. So they might ask, you know, how do I think I know, what do I think I know? from this participant or these participants? What assumptions did I make and how did my personal values and beliefs maybe shape the outcomes? Among, among other questions that you can see there. So this is a reflexive journal, an important ingredient to looking at and thinking about um, potential bias in the research. And as you will see in a minute as well, this is also, the reflexive journal is something that can also be used in your analysis. Speaking of which, analyzability. Analyzability is, um, is the second component of the total quality framework. Now, what you see here are the, are the 10 unique attributes of qualitative research. Uh, once again, you, you will not see this visualization in the book. This is something that I created after the book was published because I needed a, a convenient way to talk about these unique attributes. But, but having said, these unique attributes are discussed in chapter one of the book and we talk about each one of these. Um, I've highlighted on the slide you see here, I've highlighted the importance of context and meaning. And the reason is, is that these are two of the 10 um, unique attributes of qualitative research that are so important to analyzability and a total quality framework approach to analysis. It's, it's the whole idea of understanding the underlying meaning of what people have said back to you, not necessarily the words themselves. So, and, and meaning that you are very, very interested in context. And I've put examples there. I'm currently working with university research library teams. And one of the things that we talk a lot about is what you're seeing on the screen right now. We talk a lot about the importance of um, context and meaning in their, in the, in the data that they're creating in their research. And so for instance, they see a lot about library support. They see words like engaged community and service and impact, and they're kind of ready to run with it. And I'm kind of reining them back and say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What does that mean? You know, what does library support mean? And, and lo and behold, of course, it means different things to different people. So that is very, very um, kind of critical to to the analyzability and the whole analysis process. Another thing we talk about uh, when we talk about analyzability is the format of the data. So it's not, um, um, uh, it's, it's often the case that uh, audio data and sometimes video data will be transformed into written transcripts. From a total quality framework approach, the researcher would think very, very carefully about selecting a transcriptionist um, when creating those transcripts. And in the book, we offer some ways that the researcher should be thinking about uh, selecting a transcriptionist in terms of their knowledge of the, the category or topic and 
sensitivity to conversation and things of that nature that you can, you can see here. We also, in the book, we, uh, we talk about uh, the six basic steps to analysis. Um, and you can see what they are here. I'll tell you right now, like number one is, is select the unit of analysis in the book. Of course, we talk about all these steps. And when it comes to the unit of analysis, we talk about the importance of taking, like, so for like an in-depth interview study, the importance of the unit of analysis being the entire uh, interview, or for focus group research, the, the unit of analysis being the entire uh, focus group discussion. Um, I say this because it's not, um, it, it happens that uh, people will, researchers will use a paragraph of a transcript or a sentence of a transcript as their unit of analysis. And we, a uh, total quality framework approach very much discourages that because of why it goes back to meaning and context. Okay, the third step of the process is coding. And we talk in the book about the importance of coding, the both, both the manifest and the latent content um, using two or more quote coders. Um, and, and looking at the coding, of course, the coding accuracy and consistency across, um, across coders. We um, do not, um, from a total quality stram framework approach, do, do not um, recommend that you use a statistic to uh, judge the um, intercoder reliability, such, such as um, uh, Cohen's Kappa coefficient, um, but use other methods such as consensus. Because, because why? Because we're not dealing here with discrete items, are we? No, absolutely not. Um, we also have in the book what you see here, we, and we suggest that you offer coders a coding form. You might think of this as kind of a, a kind of a coder's reflexive journal where coders, as they're going through the coding process, can actually, you know, make some notes about, you know, why they coded a certain code a certain way for a certain piece of content. Um, it was because the nature of this content was blah, blah, blah. And then maybe offer an example of, of what they mean by that by quoting part of the content or something of that nature. This can be very, very useful in a number of ways. One is to go back and look at the um, accuracy of uh, across coders, um, also to look at intercoder um, consistency. It also, at the end of the day, can be um, very useful when you're doing your analysis. You might find that, gee, when, during the analysis process, it might be very useful to go back and really look at what coders were thinking about when they were actually coding some of that content. Now, what you see, this is kind of an interlude, kind of. This does not come from the book. This comes from my blog, and I have the citation there. But, but it very much is is very much consistent and in keeping with what the message we are giving in the book, which is what coding misses the point. The point of quality of now analysis is not to deconstruct the interview or the discussion into bits and pieces but to maintain a cohesive whole that allows each participant's perspectives to come through and to arrive themes and a narrative. So again, this, you, um, comes, this, this comes from my blog, but this is very, very um, consistent and the message and, and, and conveys the message that is in the book, just not exactly in those words. So coding's not the point, although coding is essential, it's not the entire point of, of the analysis because you need to go on to, to uh, steps, what, steps four and five, which have to do with categories, deriving categories and themes. Now categories are simply um, a group of codes, I call them kind of buckets sometimes, that share an underlying construct. Um, and you develop themes from there. What you see in front of you now is based, uh, an, an image uh, taken directly from a report I wrote um, after con uh, conducting 30 in-depth interviews with financial officers in higher education. And I came up with 10 or 12 categories or buckets of codes 
with that shared constructs. And when I looked within and across those buckets or those categories, I came up with four that I thought really in their own shape and form spoke to this idea, the theme of relationships. So um, the category of responsiveness um, in its own way talked about relationships. And same with flexibility, resolving problems, ease of process. They, these categories talked about um, uh, uh, a lot of other different types of themes that I was gaining from the research, but they all, what they all had in common is that they all, all talked in some way about the idea of relationships. Now, this, let me just say that if I had gone back to my client and I had said, well, we did this research and guess what? Relationships is really important to financial officers in higher education when deciding who they want to work with um, in, in terms of their financial services provider. And the, my client would have said, yeah, we know that. Uh, we know relationships are important. What was key here is just an, as an example, is that I could be very, very explicit and in telling them, which I did, exactly what relationships means. And I could tell them what it means responsiveness. And within responsiveness, I could tell them exactly what that means to be responsive. And I could do that for each of those categories you see there. So it can be very, very effective. Another thing we talk about in the book related to um, analysis um, and the analyzability component is CAGDIS or the Computer Assisted Qualitative Data Analysis Software. And as we say in the book, there are a number of ways, um, uh, uh, um, and, and by the way, there's over 40, the last time I counted, there's over 40 um, software programs or packages for CAGDIS. Um, to choose from. And they offer, as you see on the screen there, they offer a lot of, um, of um, benefit and good things for the researcher. Um, but the point we make in the book and the point I'm going to make here is that from a total quality framework approach, um, Cactus, you can't, you can't rest on, on Cactus. Cactus is simply a tool and that it is the researcher's responsibility um, to do the work of interpretation and creating a narrative based on, based on the, care, the contextual meaning um, uh, of your data. And so anyway, so just wanna make the point, we, we talk about this, um, we have a section on this in the book. And again, we talk about the virtues of Cactus, what it's good for, but also a reminder that it is simply a tool and where the researcher needs to, to focus. The other part of analyzability in terms of the, in, in addition to the process, the verification and, and verification takes, takes time, it might take money, um, but we, from a total quality framework approach, we encourage the researcher to do some verification. I know from my personal experience that, um, uh, uh, deviant cases is something that uh, I utilize a lot. It's it's easy to do because it's there. It doesn't take doesn't take a more time or money or anything of that nature for me to um, to look at outliers. And let me tell you, if you've done this, I don't know if you've had the same experience that I as I have had. I have had some pushback from clients when I have discussed outliers and negative cases um, because they're in, in, in some situations, they are just not ready to, um, to have that discussion. And I am there as the researcher saying, but wait a minute, that's where I'm learning the most information sometimes is learning at those, ne those negative cases. Okay, let's get on to transparency, which is about reporting. And here we talk about uh, thick description. Um, and, and what that means, which is basically um, giving enough details in your final report so that um, uh, the user of that report can fully understand uh, what your investigation in terms of the people and the topic and the phenomenon you looked at. They can assign some usefulness 
to your interpretations and recommendations and evaluate transferability. So in the book, we offer what so thick description details. What does that mean? In the book, we give you um, provide you a list of what are some of the details of your study that you might include in your thick description um, in your final document. All of which is to help provide transferability of your research. And what does that mean? It's the extent to which other researchers or users, users of your research can determine the applicability of the research design or the study findings to other contexts. So if you did some qualitative research for program evaluation, you might be able to use, um, if you had enough detail in the content, someone else may, might be able to use some aspect of what you did to look at some other aspect of, of the program. All of which, these three components that I went through quickly, I understand, <laughs> I'm trying to, trying to do this quickly to, um, so that we can, uh, we can uh, get this within our time slot here, is usefulness. It all goes to usefulness, you know, which is basically what? It's the so what component, you know? Have we done anything of value? Um, have we created something of value? Um, which means what? You know, have we contributed valuable knowledge? Have we confirmed or denied what was already known or what we thought we knew? Provide actionable steps. Can we now do something because of this research? And have we enabled researchers to transfer the design or some aspect of the research um, in another context? Okay, all right, um, Paul? Paul is now going to, I'm going to do the, um, the slide switching for Paul, but he is going to now talk about other applications of the TQF. Paul? Paul, we can't hear you. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, yes. Margaret. So, in addition to all that Margaret has explained that the book covers about how we believe the total quality framework can help you plan, execute, disseminate your individual research projects, we felt strongly that there were other ways that the total quality framework can benefit you as a researcher. And we, just, we talked about this in chapter eight, the final chapter of the book. And the highlights here, is, as this slide shows is, it can help you when you're writing uh, and structuring your qualitative research proposals. And that would include what your graduate students might be doing for their theses or dissertations. It can help you when you're uh, evaluating research proposals, whether you're in the role of an instructor and you've got a graduate student that you're mentoring, or whether you're a government uh, uh, employee and you're responsible for allocating your agency's resources to a contractor. In fact, when you're doing that, when you're evaluating the research proposal, if you're in the role of needing to write an RFP, for example, you can use the total quality framework to help you write that RFP by prioritizing what you think is especially important that you want your potential vendors to address in the proposals back to you. We also believe you can use the total quality framework to conduct what we call critical literature reviews. This has been a particular pet peeve of mine for at least 30 years. It seems that when you're a graduate student, you're exposed to a mindset that thinks that all research that's been published is of equal value. And that it's up to you when you're doing a research literature review to balance how many uh, past articles say this versus how many past articles say that? Well, to me, that has always seemed foolish because who is to say that all those past articles should be weighted equally? So we address this in what we call the critical literature uh, reviews and using the total quality framework. And by implication, we think the total quality framework, if you're engaging in qualitative research should become a routine mindset for you. 
Thus, no matter what you're doing, whether you're structuring, designing, writing proposals, you're evalu evaluating proposals, you're conducting literature reviews, you're reading technical reports and so forth, we think that the total quality framework serves you well uh, to apply to the evaluation and decisions you're making as you're doing all those things. Next slide, please, Margaret. I'm gonna actually, Margaret, deviate from the order in which I was gonna talk. So uh, okay. if, I'll, I'll speak what I'd like to do. Okay. So in the book, there's quite a bit of detail about what we describe as the total quality, qualitative research proposal. And we believe that it has best served if it has eight parts, and you can see what these parts are. From an introduction, all the way through your research design and the team that works with you and the deliverables. And number seven, the total quality framework ideally forces you as a research, qualitative researcher, to want to understand and identify the limitations of your research. And so we encourage people in their research proposals to be very serious about that section. Next slide, please, Margaret. Um, regarding the literature reviews that we've been talking about, here's a vehicle that we think can be useful by taking the major port parts of the total quality framework and evaluating an article that you've read. And now you're trying to, quote, make sense of that article. What do you think about it? What do you think the quality of that article is? Did it talk explicitly in ways that you can assess its credibility, its analyzability, its transparency, and its usefulness? So for example, let's look at the first row there under the column that says analyzability. Here it was noted that this was not really addressed thus a weakness in this article. A quick aside, being a journal reviewer for uh, article reviewer for going on 40 years now, I've seen so many articles that get published that are still insufficient in terms of what they disclose and address in my view. And I believe sincerely that using our total quality framework to help structure your research articles that you're writing will avoid these problems. And I am slowly, at least in the journals I work with, trying to convince editors to apply things like the total quality framework, similarly, the total survey error framework, explicitly to what the reviewers do. Next slide, please, Margaret. When you're back in doing your, uh, your research proposal, uh, one of the sections is your design, uh, the research design. And here's an example in the book of a vehicle that we think can be useful for re qualitative researchers to set up for themselves, if not for the people that are gonna be reading their proposal. Final, final slide that I have, Margaret, please. And so um, we've, I've already talked about, I guess this is, is not necessarily my, my final one, uh, excuse me. No, it is my so final one, sorry. So in summary, from my perspective, our total quality framework provides you a comprehensive and systematic approach to assessing quality in quality, qualitative research. It encourages you to both address the strengths and the weaknesses from the perspective of the total quality framework. It gives you a roadmap for doing that and the book explains how to do that. And of course, we think that it can be very important in doing a literature review. You yourself as the researcher or your subordinates, including your students. With that said, I turn it back to Margaret to finish up. Actually, you had one more slide, Paul. Oh, I did. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I think I implied all this, Margaret. I think so, so too. I turn it back over to you. Okay. Okay. 
Fair enough. Okay, I think that just the, the this is the final slide, and I just I, I think that the the three main three main kind of takeaways here is is that if if we, and and it's just kind of repeating what we've gone over, but you know if we can agree that qualitative research. Um, um, serves worthwhile purposes. And logically, it makes sense that it only does that to the extent that it's done well. It goes back to the very first slide, you know, is it good research? And uh, we believe that the total quality framework brings greater rigor to quality research without stifling all the reasons we conduct, all those unique attributes that I showed you earlier, those 10, we don't want to mess with that. Um, but we want to develop critical thinking skills that help raise the caliber of qualitative research designs. We believe the total quality framework does that. So our book um, um, offers examples and ways to think critically across all, qualita all qualitative research methods as well as other applications. So thank you. I feel like it was fast, but... Um, Thank you very much. Um, here's our contact information if anybody would like to get in contact. Martha? Thank you. Oh my goodness. The thank you is to both of you. What an amazing uh, book. I think there's a lot of accolades and positive comments in the chat. Uh, I think we're all really just grateful that um, qualitative research has this framework to draw on that you all have provided, not just this, the sort of the conceptual framework and the, this, the, um, the sort of efforts towards, you know, continuing the rigor, but practical tools and tips. Um, so I think I, I saw one specific question in the chat um, before, during the uh, presentation. Um, oh, I wanted to mention also the accolades included and <laughs> positive comments, a go Buckeyes from Rebecca Morrison. So Paul, I think that one was for you. <laughs> yeah. um, and then we had a question from John who asked uh, when you were talking about transcription, he was asking how um, the transition, transcription choices are affected by uh, automated transcription. And John, if you would like, um, please turn on your camera and your microphone and you can speak the question for yourself. And I would encourage everybody else um, we have lots of options for your questions, and I'll just say this and then I'll stop talking. So you can drop something in the chat, you can raise your hand, you can turn on, on your uh, mic and camera if you're willing to, uh, to participate in the discussion. And we have about 10 minutes for that. So uh, John, do you want to say any more about the, your question? Yeah, I, I was just, so, so Margaret, you mentioned like thinking about who you're, what, what you're, who you're going to select as a transcriptionist um, and sort of what their background knowledge is. Um, and more and more, there's, so Invivo has its own transcription service. Um, Amazon has a transcription service. I think Orange, uh, Otter, sorry, Otter has a transcription service and those are all specialized. And then now, frankly, Teams and Zoom, actually you can get a transcript of this entire thing from the recording. It's built into to the system. Um, so how does that affect that kind of selection, the, the thinking about the, the transcription elements of it? And that, that was that was sort of a, a question that was raised when you were talking about those. I, I was thinking about it because it's something I'm doing in my own work right now as well. I actually think, John, that that listening to you and and and, um, and what you're asking is, is something that comes up a lot and increasingly a lot. Um, and listening to you, it, it, my first reaction is, it just speaks, I think, uh, more loudly about the importance of thinking about a total quality framework approach to, to transcripts and, and, uh, and a transcriptionist. Um, you have lots of automated choices out there. What gains my attraction, what I look at is, for instance, when I get, um, something in my inbox or I hear of, um, of an organization, a firm that is promoting that, hey, hello, by the way, we use human transcribers. And that's what gets my attention. And though that's where I gravitate towards and that's what I'm going to use. So are those, there's 
there are increasingly, maybe by the day, the week, the month, uh, more and more um, AI um, options out there. And you could probably list more. And that's fine and dandy. That is not a total quality framework approach. I would never encourage anyone to, it offers, it's kind of like, I won't say that because then you'll get the wrong. I was gonna say it's sound like Cactus, but I'm not saying don't do Cactus, but I'm just saying it, it offers, you know, speed and cost advantages. And what else? Huh. I don't know. It doesn't offer me a quality um, transcript, unfortunately. And it doesn't offer me what I need as the researcher to be able to, um, to uh, comfortably and, and confidently explore the meaning and context in that transcript. Margaret, if I can add, um, you sort of got at this, that it is a tool and it can be useful, but it ideally never should be the only tool that you use. Thank you. Uh, Zachary, I see your hand is up. Uh, first, though, we had a question from Ali Sue in the chat um, about how does the book, um, does the book address how you deal with journals that require CAPA reporting on intercoder reliability? And, and then we'll hear from you, Zach. Hmm. Does this book specifically address that? No. No, it doesn't. But again, you know, and we can have a side conversation about that, but I would really, I would push back on that for the reason I gave. The CAPA coefficients aren't, aren't built for qualitative research for the obvious reasons, for all the reasons I tried to highlight today in terms of meaning and context and the interrelatedness and all the things in the 10 unique attributes of qualitative research. Ellie Sue, this is Paul. Uh, your, your question is provocative to me because for a while we've been wondering, some of us have been wondering whether uh, somebody should propose to APOR Council that there be a qualitative research related task force. Uh, and here would be an example, what you're asking of something that the task force could take on. There would be many, I'm sure, of topics like that that would be beneficial to our APOR members and other qualitative researchers that could come out of such a task force. At least that's my view. There should be that. There should be that task force. I vote for it. <laughs> <laughs> Zachary, did you wanna go ahead with your question? Yeah, um, thank you so much for this presentation and for the book and the framework. It's, you know, it's really great. And I echo a lot of what was said in, in the chat. If you scroll through and you want a, a little like shot in the arm, I think that that will be helpful. I, I think one of the things that I like most about this is that it doesn't do, um, it doesn't limit qualitative research to only its positivist uh, applications. It allows for, it, which is stifling in its own way and something that my home discipline of political science is uh, notorious for sometimes. I'm wondering what you see the relationship of this framework uh, what or what relationship this framework has to other approaches to looking at um, qualitative data quality. You're not the first to do this, and there are discipline-specific ways that this has been uh, conducted in the past. What, um, what kind of sets this apart for you? Margaret, would you start? And I, I have a comment after you finish. The, you, oh, um, a couple things. One is, and we make the point in the book, that um, this, uh, and probably the, the main answer to your question, which is what we talk about in the book, is that the framework is not paradigm specific. It's not philosophically oriented to specifically, to a, a, to a specific orientation. And I think that sets it apart. Um, having said that, there is, and I'm not gonna be able to give you the full details of it right now. And I don't know, Zach, if you've looked at this, but APA, the American Psychological Association, um, the 
qualitative folks there have put together um, a framework. Do they use the word framework? Um, around methodological integrity. And that's kind of the, the grounding of, of their framework. And I have to say that of everything I've seen, that probably comes closest to what we're talking about in that, well, you can tell by the name, you, you can tell by the name, methodological integrity. So it's very focused on the quality um, kind of issues that we talk about. So in answer to your question, we're kind of paradigm neutral. And having said what I just said, let me just interject this other difference. Um, that we're very, um, it, it's all about, it's total quality framework. So it's, 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 it's hinged on, on, on utilizing basic research principles that we all learned somewhere in school probably about survey research, but it's, it's finding how to apply some of that basic, basic good research to qualitative research without, without messing with what qualitative research is. And that is what I think is unique about our framework. Paul, what did you want to say? I just wanted to add, Margaret, uh, to Zach's question. Chapter two, where we explain the origins and what, what is the total quality framework, I think was uh, the most academic of the chapters. It was a, a lot of, lot of references cited, for example, Lincoln and Guba's work that certainly we, we uh, played a an imp very important role in Margaret and I deciding exactly what we thought the framework should be that we were devising. And then separately, I call attention to my uh, APOR presidential address in 2013, which is published in Public Opinion Quarterly, the, the December version. That address is about total error. So it, it makes reference, Margaret and I were two years into writing our book at the time. And it makes reference to how total error, in my view, applies to qualitative research how it applies to survey research, how it applies to experimental design. So for any of those of you that might be looking for a larger perspective on these quality issues, I hope that my presidential address might be useful to you. Uh, okay. Um... Thank you again, Margaret and Paul. I don't see any more, oh, something else came. Nope, just a thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. And actually we have just enough time right now um, for Mar Martha, oh, so many, Margaret's and Martha's, uh, to um, announce the book winner. So thank you again, Margaret and Paul for participating in this series and um, making helping to make it a success. And Martha, uh, I'll pass it to you. Great, uh, thank you so much all of you for attending. Um, so we did have the early registrant DC APOR member uh, that won Margaret and Paul's book today. Uh, that is Carl Ramirez, so congratulations. Uh, we'll be in touch with you shortly to get your details and send you a copy of the book. <laughs> um, if you're not already a DC APOR member, oh, there you are, Carl, congratulations. <laughs> Uh, if you're not already a, a member of DC APOR and you do want to uh, be considered for winning a copy of a book for one of the future book clubs, uh, please join uh, DC APOR. Uh, our next uh, book club meeting will be on April 12th, uh, and that will be with the editors Craig Hill and Stas Kolinikov, uh, who will be talking about their book, Big Data Meets Survey Science, a collection of innovative methods. Uh, so this book um, is a result of the Big Serve conference um, that I'm sure some of you are aware of. Uh, so you can feel free to sign up on our Eventbrite page. Um, so thank you again so much uh, for attending. Thank and I all. hope you all have a great afternoon. And thanks again, Paul and Margaret. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. So thanks great to see you all. Thanks a lot to DCA for. Thank you. Thank you. So much.